talk briefly of an example of a saint that we see in the Bible. Um, last week I talked about who a saint is, the reason, the basis, and I talked about a few confusion that come to play when we talk about a saint. Today I want to show us an example, and that example is the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 3, we will have an account of where Apostle Paul was persecuting the church, where he took it upon himself to be mishandling to let's read acts chapter 8 acts chapter 8 Acts chapter 8, verse 3. And Saul, and for Saul he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, holy men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So Saul was attacking the church. He was attacking the church. He was um, really terrifying the church but to the glory of god in acts chapter 9 he had an encounter with god and um, his story changed he became converted his story changed he became converted you know and he became an apostle not only an apostle he labored and um, went through so many trials for his newfound faith. It's, it's a typical example. I want us to look at what he said in the two Bible passages in detail. I want us to look at them. And I want to thank my sister again for reading those passages. God bless you. Thank you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is an apostle Of God is beginning he was a persecutor he was a he was a threat in fact in Acts 7 the last passages the Bible recalls that Stephen was stoned to death and Saul gave consent for him to be killed Saul gave approval for Stephen to be killed Saul gave approval for Stephen to be killed now, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles that I'm not made to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. So, in order for us to understand how Paul moved, how he transformed, verse 10, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That means Paul the Apostle had God's favor, found God's favor, found God's grace, and he was able to change. Now, what exactly do we mean by that? Um, it was not by Paul's natural doing. He did not just wake up and say, oh, this thing is wrong that I'm doing, persecuting these people. This thing is wrong. I'm not supposed to be doing this. This is evil. This is not God's purpose. This is not God's will. No, God had to reveal to him. This is where God's grace comes in. He, he had a, an, an encounter with God that only God alone could have you know, God alone would have produced, that God alone would have influenced. 
he had an encounter with God. And this encounter brought him an understanding of the havoc he was doing. This encounter brought him an understanding of his own sinful states, of his own rebellion. And this encounter brought him also the understanding of the fact that Jesus Christ has died for his sins. And he had all this understanding. And this is why he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul did not say, oh, I came to my understanding. Paul did not say, yeah, I studied or I labored to understand this thing. He says, by the grace of God. Of course, his growth in grace definitely must have been influenced by his diligent study of the word of God. But my point here is the grace of God brought him the knowledge of his sinful state, of his wicked acts. You know, and the grace of God brought him an understanding of who Jesus was. And it was Apostle Paul that brought forth the preaching of the gospel in very simple terms. It was Apostle Paul that God used to establish the principle of the doctrine. He was not physically with the disciples. But according to Acts 9, God, Jesus Christ, revealed himself to him. When we read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. You understand? So Paul is saying here, yeah, I too saw a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, the apostle, is the one God used to write to third of the New Testament. It's the one that brought about the teaching of salvation by grace, purely by grace, not of works. All this kudos to Apostle Paul. And it's so wonderful to understand that Paul attributes all this to, his, to the grace of God. And that grace brought him knowledge, number one. And along with knowledge, that grace brought him knowledge of his sinful state, of the saving grace of Christ, of the need to repent and place his faith in Christ. Also, that grace brought him the necessity of him now walking to love God and to fellowship with God. And that love and fellowship is the basis of his obeying God. Amen. That grace brought him the necessity of love and fellowship with God. And that love and fellowship is the basis of him obeying God. That's why in Galatians 5, 6, Paul says circumcision or Uncircumcision does not matter, but faith that works by love. Faith that works by love. This is so very important. Now, there's one beautiful scenario that Paul brought about. And in order for us to understand the, the true process of God's grace operating, God gave Paul this understanding of the new man and the old man. We remember in the days of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was accused of not fasting. And Jesus Christ said that the, the, as long as the bridegroom is around the as long as the bridegroom is around, the bride and the others will not fast. But when the bridegroom is taken away, they will fast in those days. And it talks about old wine and new wine, old wine skin and new wine skin. Paul talks about the old man and the new man. It was Paul that God gave this revelation through Jesus, obviously, that 
a saint has two natures within him. The new man that has been redeemed, but his flesh is still very active. The Christian that has been saved by grace, but his flesh is still very active. As a Christian, my duty is to labor and to love God, and the basis of my love will be obeying Him. But as a man with flesh and blood, I am still tempted every day to commit sin. I am still tempted every day to commit sin. The Bible said concerning Jesus, it says he was in all, in all form tempted just as we are, but he did not sin. You know, so the same way we are being tempted every day. Let's move to Romans 6. Right now, I want to quickly talk to us about the beautiful analogy of Paul. Romans 6, verse 6. Now, Paul is arguing here from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let me quickly read from verse 1 so we know the context. What shall we say then? Shall we continue sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead in sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 9, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead died no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Verse 11, Likewise ye also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying here, our old man is crucified with him. So Paul, by the revelation from God, had an understanding of the old nature and the new nature. A Christian has the old nature and the new nature in him. The vision that God has given him is to labor, to continue to kill the old nature. Paul says our old man is crucified with Christ, not is going to be, not we are walking to do it. He says it's already done. Now, what does he mean by that? It means the saints, the children of God are not enslaved by sin. An unbeliever is enslaved. A non-Christian does not have control over his flesh, but a believer ought not to lose control over his flesh because the Bible says he is in Christ. Romans 8, verse 1. Now there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. You know, so Paul is bringing a very beautiful analogy. He says, just like in Christ, we have 100% divinity. The Christ that walked on earth, he was 100% man and 100% God. A child of God, a saint has the nature of God in him and the sinful nature still there. And his vision, his aim is by the grace of God to kill the sinful nature. How? By simply obeying the word of God. The only way the sinful nature is killed is by simply obeying the word of God. Because the sinful nature will keep tempting us to sin against God. And Paul is saying we should crucify it by obeying the word of God. There's something beautiful he says in Romans 5. He says, so that as sin reigned, 
through unrighteousness. Grace might reign through righteousness unto eternal life. So it says the only way we can allow grace reign is when we practice righteousness. Now, Paul is not arguing here on the basis of we being saved or not. He has moved from there. He's saying we are dead with Christ. Our old man is dead with Christ. And Paul has used this analogy all through his scriptures. Let me quickly run through it. All through his passages. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Put therefore, put out therefore the old living, that you may be a new lump, as you are unliving, for even Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see him using the analogy of old leaven and new leaven, talking of the old nature and the new nature. Now, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 22. That he put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Can you see? Put off the corrupt... Put off the former conversation. Put off the old man, verse 22. And put on the new man, verse 24. Because indeed, the Christian has these two natures within him. And his duty by the grace and knowledge of God is to obey God by killing the flesh. The only way he can keep the flesh dead and kill it is to obey God. Paul said, our old man is crucified. It means our duty is to obey God by the Spirit. And that's exactly what he says in Romans 8. He says we have a duty, which is to walk in the Spirit. He uses the expression to walk in the Spirit. And this is the Apostle Paul telling us that this is the summation of all these is the operation of the grace of God in the life of a Christian. Paul said, back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God, and the grace upon me was not in vain, because I labored more. You see, the grace of God comes to tell us that you have a new nature. Walk in this new nature. This is your old nature. You will carry it to the grave, but kill it by obeying the word of God. Kill it by doing what pleases God. Kill it by doing what pleases God. Kill it by meditating on the word of God, saying to yourself what the word of God says, and doing what the word of God says. Now, there is there are a few things I have to bring in here because it's not as easy as I'm... Um, saying it the practice of meditating in the word of god of reading the word of god is principal to all this because the bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free so knowing the true teaching of the scripture is principal for example, that number one, the basis of our salvation is the grace of God. That number two, it is only through the spiritual light that we receive from God that we can live the Christian life. And obviously, by inference, we will take the duty of praying a lot seriously. You know, because if we are prayerless, we would um, we will not be successful. We will be struggling in our work with God. You understand? And Paul said he labored, not him, but the grace of God. What he's trying to say is God has given him knowledge. 
God has given him insights and he knows that he doesn't deserve to be who he is because he was persecuting the church. So Paul simply used the zeal that, were, that he used against the church to use it for the church. And that's a good example for us to learn from. The old man is within us. Now, there are a couple of things we can learn here. Number one, when people fall into sin, we should understand that they are not perfect because they seem a Christian has the old nature and the new nature within him. And we see this in scripture. There is no perfect person. Adam sinned. He was not perfect. Obviously, Cain is typical of it. And Genesis 17, God had to correct Abraham. I'm the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be truthful and sincere. Because Abraham sinned against God by going into Hagar. So Noah is not perfect. Noah had to sleep with her daughters, got drunk. When you look into the scriptures, there is no perfect person because a saint is somebody that has the old nature and the new nature together. Now, when a Christian does not understand this, maybe the best thing just feels let me go to church, let me do this for God, let me give to the poor. You know, this principle of old and new nature is not known to this person. Then that person has not known the basics of what being a Christian is. It is, it is, it is really just like that, you know. Because... Um, there are prophecies that predict that so many Christians would not be accepted at the end of time. Jesus Christ said, depart from me, I never knew you, Matthew 7. You know, because um, the best we can do for ourselves is to know the truth and walk in the truth. You understand? So, it's not everybody that knows this, you know. But it is very obvious, Colossians 3, 9 and 10, the Bible, Paul says it again, the old nature and the new nature. It says, put off the old nature and, you know, put on the new man that is renewed after God. So the whole message of Paul in the epistles is kill your old nature by obeying God in the spirit, by walking in the spirit, by walking in the new nature. And this is all Paul has been talking about. And this is the only way we can... Excuse me. This is the only way we can operate in the grace of God. Because the grace of God comes and teaches us to turn away from unrighteousness. Teaches us to turn away from unrighteousness. Romans 6 verse 1 that I've read. Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let's look at Titus. Titus 2. Titus is after Timothy. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation and appear to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So, this basic teaching by Apostle Paul is the process of us walking by grace. He says, the grace bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more than they all, meaning I did everything to kill my flesh by obeying the Spirit, by walking in the Spirit. That's why he writes in Galatians 5, 16, this I say, walk in the Spirit and you not fulfill the work of the flesh. You know, he says, I do everything. He writes in Galatians 2, 22, he says, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That faith is expressed in his obedience, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, so, the example of Paul here, Paul has given us a secret of how he has moved with his work with God, which is he knows, number one, that 
He has two natures in him, the divine and the sinful nature. And he says he labors to kill the sinful nature by simply obeying the Spirit of God. And we can only learn from the example of Apostle Paul. Let's read 1 John as I try to move from this topic. 1 John. John the Apostle writes something interesting here. 1 John 2. It's so wonderful. I want to read 1 John 2 verses 1 to 4. Very beautiful passage. Very beautiful passage. First of all, when we read 1 John 1, 8 to 10, it tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess it, he is able to forgive us this and that. Now, it goes to 1 John 2 and it progresses. Now, John is starting from the basics. He's saying the beginning of your fellowship with God is to know you are a sinner and Christ has died for you. Now, 1 John 2, this is what he says. Verse 1, My little children, these things I write unto you that you may sin not. My little children, saints, I write to you, don't sin. That means don't make disobeying God's word a habit. Don't make living for the glory of yourself a habit. That is sin. Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is doing things to please yourself rather than doing it to please God. Sin is thinking of the things of the flesh rather than thinking of the things of the spirit. Like we have said, sin is not only action, it is also thought. The Bible says the thought of unrighteousness is sin. So I write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but the sins of the world. Now, that word propitiation means mercy medium, the means of mercy. The means of mercy is the advocate. He has pleaded our case with God, not only for our sins. There's a beautiful thing he says here. I'm telling you not to sin, but if you fall into sin, Jesus Christ is our advocate. Is the propitiation for our sin. Is the mercy medium. Is is the mercy medium in the Old Testament? Jesus, God instructed that they put what is called a mercy seat on top of the ark. The ark that the that was constructed in the Old Testament, they had a mercy seat on top of it. Like so, this is because God said He will meet and commune with them on top of the mercy seat. So Christ is our means of mercy. What does that mean? God looks at Christ's sacrifice and overlooks our sins because of the sacrifice of Christ. Because we are in Christ. You know, just like Exodus 12. God instructed the Israelites to put blood on the doorpost. And he says, when I see the blood, when the angel of death is passing and he sees the blood, he will just pass that house and move on to the next one. Meaning the angel of death will not enter that house. Not because those people are righteous, but because they have put blood on their door. The same way Christ is that blood that causes the angel of death and wrath, as it were, to bypass us. So, he's saying here, basically, our sin is not the problem because Christ did what? Took care of it. He says, one, don't make sin a habit, but if you fall into it, Christ has taken care of it. Now, he goes further. Verse 3, and hereby know we that we know him, if we keep his commandment. Verse 4, He that said, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Wait a minute. In verse 1, he says, If any man sin, we have an advocate. Now he's saying, we know him. The evidence that we know him is because we keep his commandments. So, John is saying here, just like Paul, we have two natures within us, the sinful nature 
and the righteous nature. And he says the evidence that we are in fellowship with God is when we progress in that righteous nature. I hope you understand. He's saying when we progress in this righteous character, then that is the evidence we know God. It is just complementing what Apostle Paul is saying. Apostle Paul is saying, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Romans 6, 11. Let's go back there. Romans 6, 11. Verse 12, sorry. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you obey, in the, in, that you, that you obey it in the loss thereof. So he's saying, don't walk in the flesh. Don't glorify your sinful nature. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instrument of unrighteousness unto sin. One thing is clear that Paul is saying, the power not to sin is there. The choice is there for you not to sin. Not to commit that sin, open or secret. Not to keep saying that thing that is ungodly. You know, it's there. And he says we should use our free will, the will we still have, to follow and obey God. And like I said, these things are strengthened by a time of prayer and a time of reading the scriptures. If our routine does not allow us, I'm not talking of night vigil prayer. I'm talking of a simple few minutes prayer, asking God to open our heart to his word and then taking time to read the word to understand it. This is the basis. This is the process of growing in the grace of God. There is no other way through it. This is the process of growing in the grace of God. And this is how Paul the Apostle himself walked with God for so many years. And he will say, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. I want to tell us if we can take time to be praying and reading the scriptures and take time to be analyzing what we are hearing. The problem we have today there are so many people teaching the wrong thing. There are so many people teaching wrong things, wrong doctrines. I was discussing with a friend of mine yesterday too. The pastor where he worships, that one preaches, you don't need to ask God for forgiveness. That's a pastor. He says, you don't need to ask God for forgiveness. In your lifetime, you should only ask God for forgiveness once. Any other time, no need. So the Lord will help us, the Lord will give us grace, but it's of great importance that we 